Welcome back to NBA Today. Summer's not over yet. Some parents who've sent their kids back to school may disagree with me on that, but there's lots of <laughs> love about summer. The beach, the barbecues, NBA players hitting the podcast circuit. <laughs> so it's time for some hot summer, Mike. So you've got a couple of weeks left in the summer before teams, you know, lock down in training camp. So let's get to it. We're going to start with LeBron James. He talked about his new teammate on the shop. Take a listen. You thought through... Not relationship, because you'll always be his dad, he'll always be his son, but what's your working relationship? Is he going to call you dad at practice in the locker room? No, we already laid that. No, we already laid... No, he can't. We already laid that down. <laughs> he cannot call me dad in the workplace. All right? Once we, once we leave out of the private facility and the gates close, I could be dad, dad again okay. in the car. If we ride together okay. at home, I could be dad. <laughs> no, he got to call me, like, 2-3 or Brian. Okay. Or... You know, goat if you want to. <laughs> That's up to him. <laughs> he said the gates need to be closed. We're not the gates can't even still be open and you're calling me dad today. Look, I don't know. This is gonna be a harder transition for Bronny than I think people expect. Dad Pat Because you're so used to calling right. you know, like for siblings, I played with my sis. Right. And I was like, I never called her sis, I just called her neck because that's what you do in the household. I don't call like my dad anything other than dad, pops, papa D. Yeah. So like now I'm gonna be like, hey, yeah, you can't say hey daddy. Peter. Yeah, like, you I don't do no, that. You can't. Bobby coach, didn't you coach your son? I, I know that's that's different. Did he call you coach coach Robert? <laughs> 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 no, my, my kids call me dad. Okay. <laughs> I coach both dad, of them and they call me dad. Dad on the court. <laughs> Zach, what are your expectations for, for LeBron and Brody outside of, I would, if I were a betting woman, say that Bronny's probably going to slip up a couple times and call him dad on the court. Yeah. What, are your, what are your expectations? <laughs> How about Bronny goes the other way and kind of needles him a little bit? How about you know, old timer, old man, pass me the ball, old man, to play the age card a little bit? See, I like that. I like that. That's, I like that. Flip it on its yeah, head. Exactly. Flip it on its head a little bit. All right. Well, uh, speaking of some interesting chatter, check out what Mav Center Derek Lively the second had to say about Rudy Gobert. Who's on the posters? Who's on the TV screens? Who's on the commercials? That player is definitely going to be on the Perfect floor. Perfect example. They played the Minnesota Timberwolves. There is zero reason Rudy Gobert should have been on that court. Zero. But you are paying him about $40, $50 million. You better get your out there and figure it out. And he didn't. And he didn't. And he did not. And by the way, that was Theo Pinson interviewing Lively. Rudy Gobert just won his fourth defensive player of the year this season. But those words, they say a lot about NBA. We, we hear this all the time, how NBA players seem to view Gobert. Zach, is he ever going to be able to shake this, this perception? Uh, I, at this point, I think it's going to take winning a championship because it seems to be the favorite pastime of NBA players is just making fun of Rudy Gobert constantly. He's a very good player. He's got some flaws. His lowlights tend to be of the extreme variety, like Luka making a crazy three in his eye and then talking a whole bunch of trash that was not very nice at all. But he's a very good player. The hate is sort of strange to me. Rudy must be used to it by now because it seems to be pretty universal around the NBA. Yeah, to me, that was kind of out of pocket because he was extremely valuable, especially when Cat wasn't out during the regular season. I know a lot of people judge him on what he does and maybe his liabilities in the postseason, but still he's an integral part of that squad that made it to the Western Conference Finals. To me, when I heard that exchange, I just saw it actually, I know in a twisted, weird way, got me excited. Because we saw Derek Lively go up against Rudy Gobert. Mm -hmm. I mean, these things, like, they, they, it matters to them. Like, it's not just a rivalry because we're playing. These guys are trying to emerge as the next dominant forces out the West. And so you can see, even though the series is done, it still carries over in right. sort of how they approach and view each other. But, like, can, are we ever going to, like, say, Rudy, like, he's... He's a four... He's one of he's, three players to ever be a four-time defensive... Play, like, he's the first battle hall of... I agree with Zach. Winning yep. a championship shuts Absolutely. everybody up. Bobby, where do you fall on this? I've never seen a player so disrespected than Rudy Gobert. It feels like he has a kick me sign on, on his on his back here. Oh, Here's a, a player, as you just said, who's been a, um, a defensive player of the year. He's going to be in the Hall of Fame. And I think certainly what happened this summer with the Olympics certainly magnified things as far as him taking a limited role. Certainly there were games where he didn't even, you know, he played a couple of minutes here. And I think he's basically a pinata for all these NBA players. And I agree with Zach. Unless he wins an NBA championship, you know, he, he'll be continually ridiculed here. 
Well, let's go to his teammate, Anthony Edwards. We can't do this segment without him. He was asked about the 90s in the NBA. And this is what Ant told the Wall Street Journal, quote, I didn't watch it back in the day, so I can't speak on it. But then he continues to say, uh, they say it was tougher back then than it is now, but I don't think anybody had skill back then. Michael Jordan was the only one that really had any skill, you know what I mean? So that's why when they say Kobe, they were like, oh my God, but now everybody has skill. So someone had to speak up for the, the, the old school. Magic Johnson, take it away. I don't never respond to a guy that's never won a championship. Oh. There's not nothing to really say. He didn't win a college championship. I don't know if he even won a high school championship. For the record, <laughs> for the record, Ant did win a high school championship. But, but putting, that, putting that aside, Bobby, why so much disrespect for the 90s here? Oh, I've never seen such a naive statement, it's certainly during during the summer here. And, and, and Anthony Edwards certainly put his foot in his mouth here. I, I think it's funny that he said that he didn't get to see the players in the 90s, but I don't think he was born in the 90s when I looked at his birth certificate lately <laughs> here. So there were certainly a lot of good players. Uh, Zach, you could talk about it more. Certainly Carl Malone and Reggie Miller and, you know, certainly Jason Kidd. And we got Kobe. We got a Kobe Bryant sighting in the late 90s here, along with Michael Jordan. Zach, what do you think? I think I'm going to start a side project, and my side project is going to be I'm going to review movies that I haven't seen and admit I haven't seen this movie, <laughs> but here's all the reasons it stinks. When you preface your review of 90s players by saying, hey, look, I didn't really watch basketball in the 90s, but let me tell you all about how bad it was, I think you kind of chip away at your credibility with that preface there, so I'm not going to read much into it. I was alive during the 90s. It ain't that long ago. You can queue up some video. There was some pretty damn good players in the 90s let's move on I like the warriors have a clear second scorer if steve kerr can make room for him the golden state warriors aren't exactly topping championship contender lists heading into the upcoming season why in today's modern nba having multiple offensive stars is increasingly essential and the warriors currently lack that depth or at least haven't fully realized it they missed out on trades for all-star forwards paul george and laurie markin in this offseason leaving the focus on who could step up to fill the void alongside Stephen Curry. Whether the Warriors can find a reliable second scorer remains one of the biggest questions heading into training camp, as NBC Sports' Dalton Johnson highlighted earlier this month. Fortunately, the team doesn't have to search far for the answer. Jonathan Kuminga already proved he could be the Warriors' second scorer late last season. The Warriors showcased Curry's new running mate at the end of last season when Jonathan Kuminga took giant strides, both literally and figuratively, toward becoming the team's second leading scorer. During a nearly two-month stretch from January 27 to March 26, Kuminga started all 29 games, averaging 19.1 points on an impressive 52.7% shooting from the field. He also attacked the rim frequently, getting to the free-throw line 4.6 times per game, no other Warriors player averaged more than 3.0. Kuminga's usage rate of 27.2% in March was the highest of his career, and perhaps more importantly, the Warriors posted a healthy 18-11 record during that span. With further off-season development and increased responsibility following Clay Thompson's departure, it's easy to envision Kuminga averaging over 20 points per game, potentially even approaching 25. However, there's one issue, his spot in the starting lineup isn't guaranteed, as much as many fans believe it should be. Kuminga's 29-game stretch was cut short by injury, forcing him to miss six games. He returned to play in five of the Warriors' final six games but only started in two, largely due to Draymond Green's absence. The real question isn't whether Kaminga can be the Warriors' second scorer, he's already shown he can handle that role. The challenge lies in whether Steve Kerr will make room for Kaminga to shine as a starter at the beginning of the season, allowing him to step fully into the spotlight as Curry's co-star.